medicine to um, running a startup and you now investing in startups and working with startups. So, um, uh, you know, I'll blow through, I guess, my history fairly quickly and, and maybe leave enough time to take questions and uh, you know, hopefully provide you know, one person's perspective. Um, so, this is a little, you know, um, snapshot of what keeps me busy these days. I really juggle three jobs, if you will. Um, running Dream Adventures, healthcare investing. I also run a co-working space for startups called Venture Forth, which I'll talk about as well. And I also happen to teach part-time at, at Penn in the engineering school. Um, so a little bit on, on each. Uh, probably like a lot of you, I, I got my start being creative with little plastic bricks, um, you know, exercising my imagination, building things. And uh, I was fortunate that in, in fourth grade, I happened to be at a school that had one of these, a number of pets. This really obviously dates me. But uh, I had an opportunity to learn how to code at a fairly young age, right, eight, nine, somewhere in there. Um, and that was really an inspiration for me moving from sort of building you know, Legos to building bits and bytes and learning basic and, and starting a, a, an amateur coding um, career, if you will. Um, but I was never really around other, other uh, folks like me in terms of what my interests were going through school all the way up through high school. And it wasn't until I really came here I discovered there are other people like me who are called engineers. They like to build things, they like to figure things out, they like to solve real world problems. And you know, that was not really my peer group until I came here. So I actually came here as a natural sciences area major, whatever that means. Um, I had no idea. But within two weeks I switched into electrical engineering, where a lot of people I met through orientation happened to be uh, you know building building cool things and doing and taking interesting classes, and that, that was a much better fit. Um, so actually uh, it must have been Already uh, taking circuits with Andreas, who's here to join us today. And uh, it's a pretty phenomenal answer with forever. And uh, it was really an inspiration to see what you could do when you apply um, you know, physics and biophysics that were very similar in biology to silicon. Um, I wound up uh, joining his lab and doing all sorts of research that was um, you know, a very new thing for me. Turns out, um, it was also new to me that I took a few extra classes, did some research, they would give you a master's degree as well. So I kind of crammed all that into four, four years here. Um, but still really didn't have a good sense of what I wanted to do professionally, although I really loved the research I did in uh, advanced in his lab. Um, and uh, for, for no particularly good reason other than uh, parents uh, nagging me that we need a doctor in the family, uh, I wound up going to medical school, uh, which is not the reason to go to medical school for any of you who are considering it. Um, and uh, it, you know, I just had no sense of what what, what the life of a physician is and, and kind of all the good reasons to go into medicine. But I wound up um, going to Penn, um, not moving that far from here, and uh, getting into a combined degree program. And I did a PhD in computational neuroscience, uh, developing computer simulations of different areas of the brain, involved in memory, Alzheimer's disease. Um, really fascinating work, intellectually stimulating work, kind of built on a lot of things that I had learned as an engineer at Hopkins. Um, and, but it was still a little bit unsatisfying for me in, in terms of the practical applications of what I was working on, you know, 20, 30, 50 years out maybe, in terms of having real interventions in Alzheimer's disease or dementia in general, and that was a little dissatisfying. And the way MDPhD works in most places, you kind of do a couple years of medicine, um, you kind of get the basics, you go do your PhD, you come back, and then you go into the clinics and start doing rotations um, in each different subspecialty, learning about medicine on the wards. And it was sort of in that phase where um, I was rotating through various um, clinical rotations. And I gravitated towards radiology because that's where tech and folks tend to go in medicine. You have to play with cool tools, you're in a dark room, you don't ever have to see patients, that kind of thing. Uh, and um, you know, this is where I, I had this eureka moment, if you will. Um, this was a time where, those of you who remember Napster, this is like 99-ish. Uh, it was very easy to steal music, misappropriate music, whatever the right phrase would be, from various hard drives. Like there was no Apple iTunes store at the time, right? If you guys remember that, sort of the Wild West. And um, it was a lot easier to share digital content or, you know, in for illegitimate means instead of legitimate means. In the radiology suite, we would often see patients who were reading their MRI today, but to make a diagnosis, we need to see the MRI from six months ago that happened to be at another hospital across town, across the country. And it was digital in our hospitals, digital in their hospitals. In fact, even in the standard format, but there was no way to exchange. And it just seemed that the template for sharing uh, music was very applicable to medicine, yet nobody was doing it. It seemed obvious to me that uh, it was going to be a solved problem at some point. 
and uh, the cavalry wasn't coming, and I was better suited than anybody else that, that I knew at the time. There was sort of a hubris there, arrogance there, which you know, in hindsight seems pretty obvious uh, that you know, it may as well be me. Uh, so I wound up finishing my degree. I had gotten my doctorate conferred, um, and I, I left academia behind. I left medicine behind, did not pursue internship or residency, and I instead launched a, launched a startup, which at the time was not all that unusual, much as it is not unusual today. Probably some of you have classmates who are thinking about dropping out. They're working on a startup on the side. They're going to go work for a startup in the summer. 99, 2000, you know, it was, it was very much like that. Still the heyday of the dot-com era before there was sort of the big, the big crash. So, uh, it, was, you know, it didn't seem quite as crazy. Um, so I wound up, I can't really see the graphic that well, but I wound up starting a company called HX Technologies. Uh, and this was our mission, free peer-to-peer -peer network, share medical records across institutional boundaries. And um, I had no training in business, just kind of threw myself into it. I thought I, I must have been on the right path because where I was falling asleep in my medical textbooks, you know, if it was about business, learning how to write a business plan, or figuring out how to do a financial model, or I really kind of took to that. It was, it was much more inspiring to kind of be doing my, my own thing instead of kind of trying to fit into this medical hierarchy in the clinic. Um, so it was it, lots of ups and downs, okay? It was a nine year, nine year ride, ultimately. Learned a ton, made many, many mistakes along the way, many near-death experiences, growth, layoffs, you know, um, grand money, outside capital from the investors, uh, you know, sort of the usual stuff you would expect in a startup. Um, you know, we started out pretty modestly with a bunch of Penn undergrads, so I hired as my first team. We rented this row house in West Philly, built the prototype, this is my first trade show. We wound up ultimately, you know, writing some patents, and those were issued. Some of them haven't even been issued yet, and they're still working their way through the patent office, which kind of just tells you how slow the patent office can be, it's kind of crazy. Um, but ultimately, we had our successful exit, this sort of thing that most entrepreneurs dream of. It's not why you do a startup, if you do it because you're passionate about the problem you're solving, but um, you like to have a liquidity event at some point, if somebody is going to buy into the public. So for us, we wound up um, selling to a big Blue Cross company, the HCSD, they own Blue Cross of Texas, Illinois, New Mexico, and Oklahoma, and we became part of their subsidiary event decision, which is based outside of Philadelphia. And, um, you know, that was a, that, this was the first time I had a job, legitimately. Like boss, reporting structure, I have to report to the CEO of my decision. And um, I learned a ton being part of a big organization, uh, you know, very different culturally from running your own startup. Um, very different perspective being inside of, you know, the, the mind of a payer, an insurance company, and how they think about things. It's very different than, say, how hospitals think about things. It's very different than how, you know, some other businesses think about things. Um, for me, the the lifeline, if you will, to back to like startup land was, was becoming a mentor. Uh, and so I wound up working with Dream Adventures, which I'll talk about in a moment, as a, as a mentor to startups where I would get assigned during a program of Dream It and, and be the person who spent two, three hours a week with my team and helping them figure out their problems and introduce them to new people who are going to help them. And that was a way to kind of transport myself back to the early days of my startup. But, I, you know, after the acquisition, I, you know, after two years with Med Decision and HCSC, I left and didn't really know what I wanted to do next. Um, you know, you kind of, uh, at some level, you feel like you've won the rat race, right? You've had, you know, you've, you've had many ups and downs. You've had, you've cashed out. Um, what are you going to do now? You kind of still have you know, a good chunk of time ahead of you. Uh, and I went through developing a number of different business ideas and kind of killing off each one because now that I was much more savvy about what would work and what wouldn't, had a better sense of you know what's worth pursuing and what isn't worth pursuing. Um, and what I ultimately landed on, not because it was a, a business as much as it was a altruistic endeavor or endeavor, a way to give back to uh, startups is create create this place called VentureForth. And here in Baltimore you have places these days like Betamore, so you may have seen, or or uh, ETC, um, places where startups can go, have cheap space, have community, have a place to kind of grow their company, work as a team until they get to a point where they can really have their own space, can afford long-term lease, and you're ready to hang your own shingle outside the door. So two, two, three years ago, Philadelphia did not have a place like this, and, and that was the motivation to create Venture for it with two partners. You know, we have an 11,000 square foot campus, if you will, in the city. Uh, that you know has become a magnet for startups coming out of Penn, coming out of Temple, Drexel, just you know people moving to town with their startup. It's a really great community. And it's not just a place where people work. It's a venue for events. We bring in speakers. Uh, we make the space available to 
you know, some meetups and nonprofits. It's a place where you know, we host hackathons, that kind of thing. So it's become a, a really key piece of sort of the Philly tech ecosystem. It's not healthcare specific to all industries. Um, and since we opened a number of other places that opened across town, not unlike you know, Baltimore, you have multiple options too. So today we've got about 30 different startups, anything from one person working on an idea sometimes at night while they're holding down a job to teams of 10 or 12 or 15 who are kind of just on the cusp of deciding whether to get their own space or not. Um, the other thing I wound up doing, this is also as a way to give back, because God knows it doesn't really pay, uh, is, uh, is teaching at Penn. So it turns out in the engineering school of Penn, modeled after the engineering school of Stanford, there's an uh, entrepreneurship program, and my understanding is there's one here as well. And uh, the, the concept is, you know, how do we give engineers the tools, the basic business uh, tool set that's going to serve them either in industry or in, in running our own startup. Um, and our belief in this program, I'm the third member of the faculty, this is Tom Castle who founded the program, and Jeff Abbott is the other member of the faculty. Um, we, we put about 600 engineers through our classes every year. It's very popular, really oversubscribed. Um, and it has nothing to do with the Wharton School of Business or anything that happens over there, other than it's sort of a very condensed version of what might otherwise be spread over multiple business classes in the state of business school. But we have a very firm belief that you know, engineers make great entrepreneurs because at some level, you know, entrepreneurship, creating a company is the next iteration of developing a new technology or product. You now have to not just build the product, you've got to build the company that's going to deliver that product in the real world and support it so that it can actually be used practically and solve the problem you were hoping to solve, but now do it at scale, sort of outside the laboratory. So in some sense, it's a very natural extension of what engineers do anyway in the lab, but it does require other skills and it does require other people and it does require a lot of work beyond just the technical work of building a cool solution. Um, so, Along our, our, uh, our, our, our thesis, like engineers make great, great uh, entrepreneurs, just a pop quiz. Does anybody know who these folks are? HP. HP, okay. <laughs> That's the students. So, William Hewitt, David Packer, right? They founded HP, he's for the fathers of Silicon Valley. Anybody know what company this guy started? Medtronic. Medtronic, yes. It's a bad photo, but. How about this guy's last name and company? MIT engineer. Bose. Bose, yeah. You guys are doing better than my usual class. I, I, I throw these slides up in the first lecture of every class and see if you get people oriented. This one you have to know if you're here. <coughs> yeah, William Murray, right? Obviously. But, I mean, how many of you knew he was an electrical engineer? Yeah, some of you. Like, double E here at Hopkins. Like, yeah, great businessman, but he started it. Probably. This guy, he, he, uh, he invented Ethernet. What company did he start? Xerox. No, Xerox. Mm -hmm. right, so this is 3Com, which ultimately became a part of HP. Um, how about these guys? Do you know a company? These three engineers, this is sort of the dream team. No one, come on. Not the name. So this is Sun Microsystems. Bill Joy was sort of the, the inventor of Berkeley Unix, the inventor of the Seashell, one of the key inventors of Java. Um, all that was Sun, which is now part of Oracle. Um, this guy, now one of the biggest venture capitalists in Silicon Valley in his younger days. He invented the web browser. Next day. That's the company. This is Mark Andreessen. He's still kind of Netscape. I still remember the day where I saw the Mosaic web browser that he invented. I walked into Barton Hall in 1993, and there was this thing on a the computer there, and it was the Mosaic web browser, which ultimately became that. <coughs> like, um, you know, they, they have the, you have that moment like, where were you when JFK was shot? I was too young for that. Or where were you on 9-11? Those sorts of things. Like for me, like I still remember that day of the web browser. Um, but that was, you know, obviously born of an engineer. He went on to form two other companies, and. and uh, uh, and then ultimately become an amazing venture capitalist. How about this guy, Double E at Princeton? Most of you have probably seen his face. What? That's the company. Yeah, this is Jeff Bezos. You know, again, most people don't reckon, realize that he was a Double E before he went on to do. Uh, this is a little bit cheating, math and computer science, but he does have a computer science degree. Anybody know who this is? What company? No? This is 
is Reed Hastings, Netflix. Uh, this is a give giveaway everybody's got known. Prototypical engineer founders. This one's my, I think, my last one. This is pretty obscure. Anyway, <coughs> uh, different engineering disciplines here. I'll add uh, their partner in crime, who's actually a physics degree. Still no one? PayPal. No, not PayPal. It's Tesla, yeah, Elon Musk, Tesla, and obviously SpaceX. So this is our thesis that you know engineers make have made great entrepreneurs are actually the ideal people to be the founders of companies, and we try to give them the basic tools, you know, to be able to take whatever it is they're going to develop technically and create great companies, uh, high growth potential companies that drive those products into the market and, and really make a difference. So it turns out, you know, ten engineers have gone on to do all sorts of amazing things. Stuff of uh, Invite Media was bought by Google, Flickster. These were all 10 engineers, many of whom went through our program, ultimately founded companies that had their exits. Um, Billy Carshare, Venmo, I don't know if they use Venmo to pay your buddies after a meal acquired. So these are all, all companies that had exits. And you know, our, our thesis is that you know, this is the next generation for all 10 engineers who graduated, gone on to found companies, they're still out there growing. Um, I know there, there are a ton of them that come out of here as well, and there'll be even more, um, you know, with, the right resources and the right coaching. Um, and a big part of what we do at Dream It is to try to um, grab these folks post-school and you know, give them the practical grounding and, and the resources and the network of humans that they can interact with the relationships and kind of take things to the next level. So that's my segue into Dream It. I mean, this is, so at Dream It, you know, we basically pay you to create your own job, create your own company. And we're really all about finding extraordinary people and extraordinary teams and trying to build extraordinary companies. And we are almost always dealing with first-time entrepreneurs who have no business background or business expertise whatsoever, but have some fundamental insight to a real problem in the world, and have real skills, and have hustle, and have a desire to do something about you know, actually creating a company around, around this. Um, so we run programs, uh, we're called accelerators. Accelerators are really like startup boot camps. We run them in four cities. Uh, Baltimore is our, our most recent one. Uh, we started Philly in 2008 by three exited entrepreneurs. So we're, we're built for entrepreneurs, by entrepreneurs. That's really part of our DNA. And uh, we expanded to New York, then to Austin, then to Baltimore. I happen to run the healthcare arm, which is fairly new. Most of our programs work across all different industries. You know, consumer-facing products, enterprise-facing products. It doesn't, doesn't much matter to us. Uh, and there's at any point in time in the year, there's some dream it cycle going on. The New York cycle for the summer is kicking off in a, in a week. Um, and then we'll have a healthcare program in the summer a little bit later, and then you know, next year we'll be back uh, for, for the Baltimore winter, winter cycle again. So if you think about sort of the lifespan of a company, a company is born, you know, founded, and it, it doesn't necessarily die, but it has this liquidity event where it's going public or it's being acquired usually. And all along the way, you're, you're trying to increase the value of the company, and you're, you're decreasing risk, right? The, the birth of a company is its riskiest phase. You don't know yet, are there even customers for what you're going to build? You don't know if the team can get along. You don't know where the money is going to come from to finance things. You don't know how you're going to sell it or how you're going to operate a company. There, there's just so much risk. And so DreamIt really lives at the earliest stages of the company. We're very comfortable taking people who have an idea on a piece of paper, a great team, and we're going to take it to the next stage. So in three to four months through one of our programs, it's how do we drive up value, decrease risk, achieve key business milestones. Maybe launching a prototype, securing your first pilot, or your first customer, your first revenue. It's different for every company. But we're trying to accomplish a lot in a very short period of time. Um, we've worked with 145 startups thus far, including the nine that are uh, just graduating from the Baltimore program. And uh, some of their logos, uh, we're starting to run out of room for logos. Uh, <coughs> most of these are probably not companies you've heard of, and that's not because they're, they've died and gone away, it's they're solving you know, big problems, but niche problems in particular industries. It might be in advertising, it might be in finance, it might be in education. Um, I mean, some of the, the bigger growing ones that might be more recognizable or level up, level up uh, does mobile payments and you can pay food carts or restaurants, I forget what their penetration is in Baltimore. It may not be that high here, but Boston, New York, Philly, there's quite, you know, quite high penetration of level up as a digital wallet for, for paying for things. Or, SeatGeek is kind of a kayak of sporting ticket events, so you can buy you know, tickets to basically any event that aggregates across multiple sources. They're based in New York and, and have been growing 
you know, phenomenally as well. So across all industries, B2B, B2C, um, and um, what we start with is really, you know, best and the brightest. And it's not that you have to have a degree. Actually, we don't care whether you have a degree. We don't care if you drop out. It's just that being in and around some of the you know, top academic institutions is generally a pretty good signal for someone who is smart, driven, takes the initiative, and figures stuff out on their own. They tend to be in that setting. Um, they also tend to be people who um, have done something in the world after school, which is generally where the insight comes from as to what the problem is they want to solve. It's really, I mean, when you look at startups coming out of undergrad institutions, you know, how many ways to reinvent, you know, use book sales, are there? Or how many ways are there to create a new social mobile app where we're going to meet together before we figure out what party we're going to tonight, right? It gets pretty tired. If you're going to be doing something in the world that's going to make a difference, chances are you spend a little bit of time in industry to figure out where the white space is that needs to be filled. And so many of the entrepreneurs that we're working with, you know, they're at school or they're at school getting an advanced degree after they've spent some time in industry and they kind of know what they want to do with their lives in the sense of, you know, there's this problem, nobody else is solving it, I'm the best person suited to go after it, and I'm going to, you know, sink my teeth into it and be that heat-seeking missile, you know, walk through walls, take no for an answer a thousand times and still keep going. And that's the personality. Uh, so we, we look for great teams, but we look for them all over the world. These, these are where the companies from Baltimore came from for our last cycle. Five of them were actually in and of uh, Baltimore already and, and had links to Hopkins in various uh, dimensions. Um, this was team able here with three Hopkins engineers, two haven't even graduated yet, and they kind of put their studies on hold to come to, to dream it. Um, we had three overseas companies. You know, we're looking for the, the best and brightest, great ideas. That's much more important than physically where they are. But we do bring them to the same space. So in Baltimore, we, were, we had the benefit of being down at Belt Point, Bond Street Wharf amazing space, and uh, we create a community. These 10 companies come together, similarly talented individuals. You know, they learn from each other, they help each other, they have different <coughs> skill sets, not just within their teams, but across teams. And uh, our job is to take away obstacles, give them every possible advantage, um, and, and help them achieve those milestones. So many people apply to agreement because of the money, and they think, oh, we're gonna get some money, and we're gonna, and, and it's not really about the money, but we do give them some money. The non-healthcare dream that you is a three-month program. You get $25,000 per team. The healthcare specific program is a month longer. You get $50,000 per team. It's your money to do with it as you see fit, whether it's you're going to pay rent or security software. Whether you're going to pay rent, whether you're going to pay for an engineer you need to hire, intern, or whatever. It's your money to do with it as you see much more important are the things we start to throw at you beyond the money. So while we don't have a formal curriculum, two, three days a week, we're bringing in subject matter experts in a whole variety of fields who can go super deep on very practical subjects. They may be business related, technically related, design related, domain knowledge and healthcare in our healthcare program. They're, they're people who've been there before, they've done it before, they're sharing best practices, tools, techniques. It's not theoretical knowledge, it's if you're gonna go sell to the enterprise, like a big company, here's how you sell effectively to big companies. And, and try to get people up to speed uh, as quickly as possible. You're getting free legal while you're with us, so we have the top law firms in town, which are only about two or three of the Dream It companies. And for the period you're with us, you know, it's pretty much anything, any legal work you need, you're treated like a regular client, but there's no meter running, it's totally free. You know, literally tens of thousands of dollars of value being given to you for that. Um, and then there's various levels of coaching. So this is Steve Welch, she's one of the founders of Dreamit. Um, and we'll meet, we're, we're, you know, during Dreamit, we're your unofficial board of directors. There'll be two partners meeting with each team every week or every other week, depending on how far into the program we are. And we're there to, you know, help think through the strategy. We're there to hold feet to the fire. We're there to report out on what happened last week, what's happening next, who, we, who should we connect you to, how can we help you uh, in some way. You know, we're also assigning off the coaching. We're also assigning you this dedicated mentor, right? So to go back to my story, you know, I was one of those mentors early on. Dream it mentors tend to be cashed out entrepreneurs, extra time on their hands, would like to give back, want to spend a few hours a week helping a company any way they can. So that's an important piece of, of the coaching as well. About halfway through the program, we start bringing in investors, uh, angel, angels, uh, venture capitalists, to meet with companies, not because they're going to write a check, 
but because it's important as a first time founder of a company that you understand how investors think if you're planning to raise money at some point in time. So it's important to get feedback on your idea and your progress from the investor, but what's even more important is to understand for this category of investor, where do I need to be to be an investment grade company? Do I need to have a million dollars in revenue? Do I need to have a thousand users, a million users? Do I need how many installs do I need to have? Those sorts of things. It lets you know what are the milestones you need to hit and then work backwards from there. Okay, well, now I'm going to go hit those things. And in the meantime, you know, the investors, they start learning about you. They're interested in you. They start tracking you. They can introduce you to other people even if they haven't made an investment in you. They want to see you actually hit the milestones that they laid out there for you, saying, hey, I want to see you do A, B, and C. If you do A, B, C, and D, awesome. So it's really important for, for first-time entrepreneurs to understand how investors think if they're going to be looking for outside capital, and we, we help grease the skids for that. Um, in the healthcare program, the other thing we do is create um, really deep access to major players in the industry to create other shortcuts for the company. So probably the hardest thing you will ever do as an entrepreneur um, is really sign your first customer, it, at least if you're selling a product to big business. It's different if you're selling a product directly to consumers. Uh, it's really hard in very conservative industries, places like healthcare, where they're risk averse and they don't want to work with startups. So part of DreamIt is bringing these partners in, making them um, understand the benefits of working with startups, and encouraging them to open up in a fundamental way so that our startups have access to subject matter experts, to executives, healthcare clinicians, so that they can have the conversations to figure out exactly what they should be building. Because it's really not, you know, entrepreneurship is not a build it and they will come kind of thing, which is a very engineering mentality. I know the solution, I'm going to build it, and somehow somebody's going to buy it. And I was that guy. I mean, I was that guy, I figured out the solution, and that sales and marketing stuff, that's total bullshit. Somebody, you just got to hire some, you know, idiot out of business school, and they're going to make that happen. It's totally the opposite. It is a given. It is table stakes that your technology is going to work. The hard part is getting somebody to buy it, someone to cut a check. And so the faster you figure out what you should be building and what people value and what they're willing to pay for what they're building, the, the, the better it is. Time's your enemy in a startup. So it's all about burning intellectual capital before financial capital. So getting a fast track to industry players who are ultimately going to be your customers is really very key. As part of expanding, you know, this network of human relationships that will, you know, lead to success. So it wouldn't be an accelerator if we didn't have Demo Day. Demo Day is for this capstone event. It was last week here in Baltimore. On Wednesday was Demo Day, where we invited several hundred investors, industry figures, the press. Each company gets seven minutes to get on stage. We literally give them a platform to share their story. What did they do three, for the last three, four months? Where are they going? What's their ask? Maybe it's financial. Hey, we're going to raise half a million dollars. Maybe it's we're looking for really talented software developers. Maybe it's, you know, we'd like some introductions to these hospitals. But it's their opportunity to tell their story and uh, meet even more people and advance the company. Usually it's a pretty high visibility event. You know, the press come, they write nice articles about you afterwards and kind of start putting you on the map. Um, there's also a very robust alumni network, as you might imagine at this point, not unlike graduating from university. And, uh, you have alums you can tap, and at any point in time you'll find, you know, you can pick up the phone and call somebody from Hopkins who you, you just want to network into their organization, saying, hey, I'm a Hopkins student, a Hopkins alum, you have 15 minutes to talk to me. It's a very powerful thing, which I hope all of you will use in your careers. Um, it's true of any school you go to. Um, for DreamIt, it's slightly different in the sense that there's a very active community, this is our closed Facebook group, um, where there's a constant conversation going on. Hey, who, you know, what are you using for CRM software? Or I'm going to be in Chicago next week, and I'd like to meet with this angel investor. Does anybody know him and make an, can make an introduction? Uh, I'm going to be in San Francisco. I need some place to crash. You know, so companies that have been through DreamIt but don't know each other are all on here, all part of sort of this shared bond, want to help each other. Um, and it's a very important resource for companies as they're going through DreamIt and certainly after DreamIt. This is the price of admission. Uh, for standard DreamIt, companies give 6% of their company to DreamIt to be in it. Healthcare, longer, more money, you give 8% of your company. The other distinction with DreamIt Health is it's not just 8%. DreamIt Ventures only takes 3%. 5% go to, you know, Baltimore goes to Hopkins, and in Philadelphia it goes to Independence Blue Cross and Penn Medicine. So, you know, these strategic partners are truly taking a position, an equity position in your company and making a, a real investment. Um, so, you know, this is common stock. You know, without going into the details of the finances, we're really aligning ourselves alongside the founders, 
ultimately this gets you know squashed to be you know worth a lot less once the company grows. And if you are worried about diluting your company and giving the company away, um, you are completely focused on the wrong thing as an entrepreneur. Your job is to make a bigger pie, and because owning 100% of nothing is still nothing, your job is to get to be a $100 million company, and if you happen to own 10% of that, at the end of the day, you're doing pretty well. Um, your, your job should not be worrying about you know, giving 2% to this guy or 3% to that guy. But um, easy for me to say, where I stand harder when you're the person who's done it. Um, things we look for, I mentioned earlier, it's all about the people and the team, complementary skill sets, they've done something before in the world, a project they're passionate about, they saw through and executed on. They tend to know each other and work together before, so, you know, it's nice you met at a hackathon last weekend, it doesn't mean we're going to invest in you for the next 10 years because you might blow up three weeks from now when you decide to hate each other. That's not a good story for us. So, we're trying to work with people who have, you know, some history of operating together and balancing each other out. Um, it's got to be a big problem that's really interesting. We don't really care what your idea is. We don't care what your technology is because we're pretty sure it's all going to change. But if we bet on the right jockeys and not the horses, we know you're going to figure it out pretty fast what it is you should be building or what technology you need to add, what the product needs to look like. And so it doesn't matter if, you know, how attractive the market is or how clever your solution is. If you're the wrong people, you know, you're doomed as a company. And so um, you know, that's very important. It always helps when you know companies have actually made some progress before they come to us, but again, that's not really, really critical. All right, that's it for my, my story. Kind of abrupt. Still, still work in progress. You know, um, I love working with multiple startups as a coach. You know, instead of being all in on my own, at some point, you know, there may be some other company I start or join. Um, you know, nothing. You know, nobody's working at any company for 20, 30, 40 years anymore. So, you know, you should think about your own trajectory in terms of, you know, what it is that you love to do and what makes you happy and what kind of gives you a uh, sense of purpose and you can continue mastering new skills and, and have the autonomy and initiative to do what you want. And, you know, for me right now, it happens to be, you know, investing in startups and working with them, you know, as, a, as more of a coach instead of running one. But um, I've yet to figure out ultimately long term what I'll be doing. That's it on content. Questions? So that yeah. was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I certainly appreciate your candor. I just have a quick question about your thoughts on PhD students and DME um, grad, PhD graduates and you know, how how your company could would incorporate. discipline itself, I think, is not really relevant. Um, I think it's it's the problem-solving orientation of any engineer. It's the ability to figure it out and build it on your own. Uh, it's knowing what questions to ask and being able to, to take the initiative. Uh, it's much more important than the actual discipline. I realize that this group is the EME group, and there may be some other people around. Um, what I would say is, you know, healthcare is an enormous industry. It's $3 trillion spent. I mean, that's staggering sums. Um, it's hard to appreciate how much that, you know, that, is, that is. And so there's, it's so broken. And there's so much opportunity, whether it's devices, whether it's software, whether it's new, new diagnostics, new therapeutics, new agents. What, I mean, so that's the world in which biomedical engineers are, are entering, whether it's to go work for Medtronic or whether it's to go create your own company and your own product. Um, you, I, I do fundamentally believe your engineering training is, is what pairs you best, whether it's a corporate job or whether it's starting a startup. Um, but I, I do joke when I'm out talking to people about how overeducated I am, because for what I do and what I wound up doing, the fact that I have a PhD, an MD, even my master's degree, like it's pretty much irrelevant. And I realize it's not a great story for a university where tuition is about $67,000 a year, right? My daughter's 16, she's applying to college next year. You know, I'm looking at dropping a quarter million dollars to come to an amazing place like this. But, you know, I'll tell you, when we're going to hire people, I really don't care what classes you take. I don't care what your GPA is. I only care what you can do, right? So we're gonna look at your resume and we're gonna look at your hobbies. And we're gonna know, wanna know what's, what are your side projects? What are the things that you actually went and built? What skills do you have more than what classes you took? And 
<laughs> you know, educational institutions have a big challenge cut out for them, which is in the current era, how do they stay relevant? And how do they prepare people for what the world is looking for to hire them to do? So maybe not the, the official piece of the answer great. for the university, but I will drop that quarter of a million nonetheless. And sort of so where is your daughter going to go? Where is she going to go? Bodwin College or Hopkins? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, so it, it's, such a, it's such a crapshoot. You know, it, it, there's no way to understand how university admissions work. You can be in love with the place and have, you know, and, and be perfect for it, and it just doesn't work out. So no, I was, I was yeah. comparing a, an Ivy League school versus a, a good liberal arts school, like Harvard, Ford, Swarthmore, Williams uh, College. Yeah, I, I, what I'm learning, this is my, my oldest of three children, is that you got to find whatever is the best fit for them personality-wise. You know, she happens to want to go to a university and not a small liberal arts school, and you know that resonates with me because what would have happened if I had gone to a liberal arts college with no engineering school? You know, I would have never found my calling. Um, so I like the notion of going someplace where there's a lot of options. You're going to figure out. Nobody knows at age 16 what they're going to do. Um, but it's one person's perspective. Yeah. So my name is Jamie, I'm a PhD lecturer for engineering. And my question is more about uh, how does training work? Like, because I, I kind of interpret you guys as a, some sort of financial institution you know, supporting the startups. So I wonder, like, where does the money come from? Like, where do you guys get money to fund the startup? And what's your exit ways, like exit options? Because you guys seem not like to be a VC. Right. So when do you expect to exit? So we're we're like a very early stage venture capital. Oh. Um, it's probably the best way to think about us, except that you know venture capitalists will come to board meetings from time to time. They don't really sit next to you and think through your business strategy and help you build a financial model and you know they'll make some introductions. But you know we're all startup operators agreements, so we're making investments, but we're also helping you operate the company while trying to stay hands off and, and we're just trying to help you avoid you know, the pitfalls and landmines that we've all fallen in or stepped on, whatever analogy you want to use. Um, we get our money from other investors. So those can be uh, individual angels, they can be family offices, like very wealthy individuals, and this is just another, it's a different asset class. You're making an investment in a company that could be you know, the next Oculus Rift, I don't know. You know pick your, pick your, your uh, big exit, those tend to be pretty unusual, the, the multi-billion dollar exits. But, you know, we're in for the long haul. We're making an investment. The program is three or four months, but we anticipate it will be seven to ten years before you have your exit. We're, we're still there to help. In fact, we have a separate pool of funds that we can use to make follow-on investments in the companies as they grow. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's an investment vehicle with a very heavy operational three months starting at when we start. So that's all you said. Is seven months, eight months, this is all your involvement with the company, with the startup? Well, they go through this structured program for three to four months, and then they graduate. And after that, you know, they have to go find office space. They have to go continue growing their company. They can call us any time, and they do. And about 25% of my time is working with graduates who are raising money, they're negotiating deals with big customers, they want to think through some change in their strategy and get some advice. But it's up to them to call us. We're there for them. But we're not, we'll reach out once every six months for an update, hey, how's it going? Can you, because we have, you know, we have to report back to our investors, how is the portfolio of companies doing? Um, and some companies are more active than others in leveraging us. The reality is once you're two, three years out, you're growing, you have other investors, you have other advisors, you're going to rely on Dreamit a lot less. And so that's the six, you know, the six to eight percent is really for those four, five months, six months, eight months, people who really actively coach and mentor. Yeah, I mean, we're, we think we're, we're contributing $200,000, $250,000 of value during that three to four month period for which you're giving up 6% of the company. Mm -hmm. So if you do the math, you know, that values you at, you know, two and a half, three million dollars, which is, you know, about right for where in the state most of these companies are. Mm -hmm. but, you know, our, our share of the pie shrinks over time because, you know, you wind up raising money from other people and you know, giving pieces of the company to other people. Um, yeah. Is your legal advice 
sorry, is there is there legal advice also from the patent system? Uh, probably not. Uh, the legal folks will carve out patent work as being uh, very expensive and as sort of on your own to negotiate with them. Um, searching, offering patents, prosecuting patents, that's the one area where the law firms kind of say, up to here, but beyond that, you know, we're going to have to negotiate something separately. But I would say that, you know, from our perspective, um, patents are the least of your worries. Um, you know, it's important to get them, they look good, but as a startup, you have no ability to enforce a patent once you get it. You're not, you're, you have a freedom to operate. Yes. Yeah. Right. That's important to know that you're free to operate. And you can hire people, but again, if you're a good entrepreneur, you go on uspto.gov, you do the searches, you dig in, you find out what else is out there. Like, if you're the founder, you're going to be master of all trades, you know, or, or at least jack of all trades, you know. But uh, until you have a bigger team around you, and so figuring out the IP is just another piece you, you got to figure out. Uh, how, how many people would you say you need to, for a typical startup? What's your average? Two, three hours? We, you know, generally speaking, we will only work with teams, which is a little bit hypocritical in the sense that many of the dream of founders, like myself, we uh, sole founders of companies and we build a team around us. Right. But we'll take anyone two or more. The reason for that, the reason for our hypocrisy, if you will, is there's so much going on in this period of time that if you can't divide and conquer, can't possibly get out of it when you get out of it. So as small as two, usually it's three founders, sometimes four. But once they're in the program, they start adding interns and other people around them. So it can, you know, a team might move to six or eight during the program. So there's usually a core group of founders, yeah. So that goes by the question. So you said that uh, the, this team have they have to know each other, right? We we like to see that. That makes you more competitive. Let's so put it that are, way. It's not an absolute requirement, but it's always better when we see that. So these are other graduates that are people that have just graduated. How do you expect them to have like, all this experience together? You know, they've spent four years hanging out, working on little projects, okay. class projects. They went and hacked the Linux kernel together, and then submitted that to Linux as you know a patch okay. to some problem, or you know that kind of stuff, right? Um, it, we don't expect them to build a company together. Um, we don't even really necessarily expect them to know a lot about business. On the other hand, there has to be at least one person on a team who we believe can articulate what they're doing, can sell the vision, you know, and mark, you know, market it, you know, sell other people on it. If, we, if they can't, if there is somebody, if there's nobody on the team who can talk in an articulate way about what they're doing, um, it never works from our, our standpoint. It doesn't mean they won't be successful means that when we look back at our 145 companies, what worked, what didn't, you know, there, there are certain red flags for us at this point, the things we just avoid. Yeah? Yeah, so sort of good on top of that question, so what would be your advice for my co-founders, like in terms of personality? Yeah, I think it's really hard to like go out and say, oh, I need to find a co-founder, and now I'm going to go to <coughs> networking events and hope to run across my soulmate <coughs> in that sense. Um, but there are groups like, you know, Programs Lab is one of the ones events in various cities where people go and the idea is to try to find, you know, speed date, find their founder, co you know, soulmate, whatever it is. I, I think the best thing is, honestly, you know, if you're going to be in an educational environment like this, think about, you know, just the projects you do for classes and the, the teams you form around assignments and did you click or not? You know, how did you divide the workload? You know, do you like working with this person? Do you compliment each other? I think you know, from an entrepreneurship standpoint, I know at Penn I would love to see more cross-disciplinary uh, interactions where you have people at Wharton or you have people with a business you know, bent who get to work on some project with the engineers and vice versa and get to see what each other bring to the table. Not around a company, but just around some simulated exercise for a class. Um, and then maybe together decide to go do something. Um, the, the reason I, you know, if you've maybe been to like a startup weekend type hackathon, you know, the power of that is not you're going to create a company out of what comes out of startup weekend. It's that you're going to meet some really interesting people from all walks of life and you're going to spend a weekend putting together a business plan and trying to hack together some code and make something work. And that's probably going to fail. The people you met, you may go do something else with. Yeah? 
How much time does it take to found the company? Are the, the people that you invest in, are they self-employed? Are they professors? Do they work part-time? they quit their job? I mean, for us, you've got to be all in. You know, we like to see you, you, you burn the boats, you're not going back. This is what you're doing from Hell or High Water. Um, oftentimes, people we take realistically, they do have fallback. Like, if, for me, my company hadn't worked out, I could always go back to do an internship and residency and become a practicing physician. So most people, they'll take, they take a leave of absence, they put it on pause, they come, whatever they were doing, they're all in full time, 16 hours a day, seven days a week, this is their passion, this is all they do. And we don't want it any other way. That's not to say there isn't a safety net if it doesn't work out. So when, when you take on uh, a team, are they already a company? Are they self-sufficient? No, I mean, they could be anything. Like often, they haven't even formed a company yet. It's just a group of people working on something promising, good people, promising concept. Um, during DreamIt, working with their law firm, they form a company, they figure out how to split up the equity, they develop their employment agreements, and independent contractor agreements, and non disclosure agreements, and they, they put together the, the structure. They're going to have to sign stock purchase agreements with DreamIt to give us our equity stake. All that stuff happens, often happens during the program. But, you know, sometimes we also get more advanced companies where they've worked a lot of that out in advance. Usually the ones that have worked it out in advance have made big mistakes along the way, and then we have to go mop up, you know, during the program. So, but we, we take people all at all stages. Yeah? Um, do you think going to graduate school or getting a PhD will help the entrepreneurship skills? Um, or or would, you, would you advise how? Uh, Undergraduates to after they leave the league, after they graduate school, uh, go on and take the entrepreneurship path? Or um, do you think the PhD helps in I mean, again, it goes back to I wouldn't do anything differently than this year, okay? My, my PhD helped me tremendously. My MD helped me tremendously. Okay? My MD, you know, I have the secret handshake. I can get a meeting with docs. I can speak their language. They don't delete my emails because it says MD after it. You know, that kind of thing. You know, it's stupid, right? You know, stupid, whatever, you know, how many years I spent in medical school. But that's like what I got. My PhD means I can jump into, you know, the deep end in any technical field. I can figure out who's worked on it, who hasn't worked on it. I can, I wrote grants and got our company funded for five years just on grant funds alone, non dilutive capital, only because of my training as a, as a PhD student. Um, and the credibility to the scientific review committee that this is somebody worth entrusting money with. Now, having sat on those committees, I realized how misguided they are too. That if all your if your only filter is you know we're not giving money to anybody who doesn't have an MD or PhD, there's something wrong with that. Um, because most of you know, many very successful businesses have, have none of that. Training. You know that said, like I don't think you should be taking the path of entrepreneurship unless you have the spark of an idea that wakes you up. You know when you wake up in the morning, what you want to work on is that. Like. You know, I, I, I failed OBGYN in medical school. I literally failed it because instead of like reading it and taking part in my rotation, I was like writing my business plan while I was on the wards and doing the bare minimum to get by. I actually passed the exam. The residents thought my attitude was so bad, like they forced the director to kill me. I had to do remedial obstetrics and gynecology to get my MD. But like I, like I woke up and I knew that this is what I wanted to work on. I think most, and that, that's not an aberration. I think most people who are successful as entrepreneurs founding companies, they have found this passionate thing that drives them. Uh, so until you have that, I think I think it's a mistake to say, oh, entrepreneurship is cool, it's the new black, I want to do that. I'm going to search the world for a great idea to work on. It generally doesn't work that way. It generally works if you're in some technical field and you're finding a problem that isn't solved. You're in industry and you can't believe this is the way things are done every day. There's a better way. I'm going to make it make that. That's just how I feel about it. Yeah. 